Good morning and good evening. My name is uh, Yasheng Huang. I'm a professor at MIT Sloan School of Management and the president of Asian American Scholar Forum. Today is a very special event. AASF was founded after Professor Gang Chen was arrested on false charges and our organization is dedicated to the principles of open science, freedom of explorations, and racial and social justice for all. Today, we gather here to reflect upon the case of Professor Gang Chen, but I think Professor Chen would agree with me that this is not an occasion for celebration. China Initiative is still with us, and there are hundreds of scholars who have been impacted, and they may be even more in the future. There's no victory yet for the principles that our organization, and I know Professor Chen also holds dear. Let me thank the co-sponsoring organizations and the representative of these organizations, Jasila Kusakawa of AAJC, Jeremy Wu of APA Justice, Yi Guangju of Asian American Academy of Science and Engineering, and Michael German from the Brennan Center for Justice. Let me also acknowledge and introduce some special guests who are in attendance today. Janet Wing, Executive Vice President of Research and Professor of Computer Science, Columbia University, Peter Michelson, Senior Associate Dean for the Natural Sciences and Professor of Physics, Stanford University. Ed Lasawaska, uh, 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 Professor at University of Washington. Stephen Meyer, RWTH Icon University, Germany. And uh, uh, Kathy Yellick, Vice Chancellor of research and professor of computer science, UC. And Professor Randy Katz, professor of computer science, UC Berkeley. Now, let me turn the podium to Michael. Michael. Thank you very much, Yasheng, and thanks to the Asian American Scholars Forum. On January 14th, 2021, just days before the Trump administration ceded control of the Justice Department to the Biden administration, FBI agents arrested MIT professor Gong Chen at his home and charged him with wire fraud for allegedly failing to disclose affiliations with entities associated with the People's Republic of China and applications for US government grants. The Justice Department announced its China initiative in 2018 as an effort to marshal resources to address economic espionage committed by agents of the PRC and Chinese Communist Party. Instead, according to an analysis by MIT Technology Review, the bulk of the China Initiative cases don't allege espionage. Rather, they have primarily targeted Chinese American academics, scientists, and researchers for administrative errors in filling out grant applications. To its credit, MIT administrators and faculty stood by Professor Chen and with the aid of skillful defense counsel on January 20th, 2022, the Justice Department dismissed the charges. We're very lucky this morning to have uh, Congressman Ted Liu, uh, who represents California's 33rd district. Uh, he's serving his fourth term in Congress and currently sits on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was also elected by his Democratic colleagues, this Congress, to serve as the co-chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee for a third time. Representative Liu uh, knows security. Uh, he's a former active duty officer in the U.S. Air Force and retired as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. So we're very fortunate to have you, uh, Congressman Liu. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you to all the wonderful organizations that put this event together. I've actually never been at a press conference with nearly 900 people, so good for you in getting all these participants. And thank you to the amazing and terrific panelists we have today. I think it's important to understand that racial profiling 
at the Department of Justice predates the China Initiative. I remember when I was sitting in my office in Congress in 2015, I read an article about how Sherry Chen was arrested by federal agents accused of espionage. Uh, and then later on, uh, all charges were dropped after her life was turned upside down. So I started to write a letter to the Department of Justice and circulate it among my colleagues. Before I could finish doing that, I remember reading another article, this time about Professor Xi uh, at Temple University, who also had his life turned upside down when he was falsely accused of espionage type activities for China, and then having all those charges later dropped. And as we looked into this, we saw additional cases that looked similar, where defendants had their lives ruined, they were arrested, and then later on, their charges were dropped. And one of the things that was similar that ran through these cases is um, many of them looked like many of you and me. Uh, they happened to be Asian defendants. And so the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and others working with many of you and other civil rights organizations, we did press conferences, we held events, we met with their Obama administration at the time with their Department of Justice. And one of their actions we got done is the Department of Justice committed to implement implicit bias training for law enforcement officials. And to us, there was a recognition that the DOJ knew something was wrong, that something was happening with these cases, either it was overt or implicit bias happening. Unfortunately, when the Trump administration took over, they did not execute that training. So this administration, we went back and we had meetings uh, with Attorney General Garland. We also uh, asked him questions. Uh, I asked him questions at a Judiciary Committee hearing publicly uh, to commit to doing this implicit bias training. Grateful that he did. We then follow up again and they acknowledge that they are going to go forward with this implicit bias training. So I think uh, that will be helpful. At the same time, we now see a China initiative that has actually made things worse. You have cases like Professor Hu, who again uh, was completely brought up on charges that should never have been uh, brought to him. And what you see in that case is also an FBI agent um, making either misleading statements or just outright lies. And at the end of the day, the judge granted uh, a motion uh, to dismiss, which is rarely done because federal prosecutors first of all, have a astounding 90% some conviction rate. In this case, the judge dismissed that case, concluding that essentially, even when you look at all the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, no reasonable jury could conclude that Professor Hu uh, broke the law. And to me, that showed that if Professor Hu's last name was Brown or Smith, uh, those charges would never have been brought. And then we now see recently Professor Chen, who again, uh, was accused of false charges, basically administrative paperwork type charges that had nothing to do with espionage. And it makes you wonder, well, what does not disclosing something on grant form have anything to do with spying? Well, well, it doesn't. And we know that because a federal judge a few days ago in the case of Professor Tao limited the evidence that the Department of Justice could bring in because that was now yet another case of an administrative paperwork type uh, failure to disclose that the Department of Justice is bringing. And in that case, the Justice Department wanted to bring in all this evidence about China's purported espionage and spying activities in the U.S., except this is not a spying case. Uh, it's a case about getting grant funding. And it's important to know that these cases have nothing to do with spying or espionage. And the judge in that case rightfully uh, prevented the Justice Department from, again, injecting irrelevant evidence to try to taint um, the case uh, in favor of them. And at the end of the day, what we're seeing here are cases being brought by the Department of Justice that simply would not have been brought if the defendants were not Asian. So we also had a meeting the members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus with uh, Matthew Olson of the Justice Department. He's doing a review of these national security cases. It is our hope that they come to the same conclusion that they need to stop bringing these cases that have nothing to do with espionage and spying. And if they're gonna bring a fraud case, that's fine. They can bring a fraud case, but these are not national security cases. And it really shouldn't be something that the Department of Justice is spending all its time focused on when there are much greater and more important issues that they should be tackling. With that, happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you again for having me on the panel. 
Thank you very much, Representative Liu, and thank you for all you do in Congress to support the Asian American community and to protect the civil rights of all people. And I, I hope that you can stay and participate in the Q&A at, at the end of the, with, throughout the panel. Sure. Great, thank you. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, of course, the man of the moment, Professor Gang Chen. He's the Carl Richard Soderberg Professor of Power Engineering and the director of the MIT Paparaldo Macro Nano Engineering Laboratory. Uh, my technological skills uh, make it difficult for me to even say that. Uh, his research interests center on nanoscale thermal transport energy conversion phenomena and their applications in energy storage and conversion. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, his defense attorney, Rob Fisher. He's a par partner at Nixon Peabody's Government Investigations and White Collar Defense Group. Uh, he previously served as an assistant United States attorney for almost a decade, and during that time handled some of the federal district's most complex and high-profile white-collar crime cases. He's received numerous awards for his work as a federal prosecutor, including the U.S. Department of Justice's award. Uh, his, he received a Juris Doctor, Doctorate from Boston University School of Law and a B.S. from Northeastern University. And finally, we have uh, Professor Maggie Lewis. She's a professor of, law at, a professor of law at Seton Hall University, and her research focuses on law in China and Taiwan, with an emphasis on criminal justice and human rights. She's been a Fulbright Senior Scholar at National Taiwan University, a Public Intellectuals Program Fellow with the National Committee on the United States-China Relations, and a delegate to the, delegate to the US Jap, Japan Foundation's US, Japanese leader pro, US Japan Leadership Program. Uh, Professor Lewis is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a non-resident affiliated scholar at NYU School of Law's U.S. Asia Law Institute. Welcome to all the panelists. Uh, Rob, I, I wonder if we could start uh, by having you summarize the, the case that the Justice Department brought it against Professor Chen uh, and how you uh, came up with the plan for his defense. Sure. Thank you, Michael. And, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for having us here today. I know this is a very important day uh, for Professor Chen. It's been a long road. Um, and, and I would like to start by thanking Professor Chen and his family. Uh, he, he made my job amazingly easy. Um, he, you know, they were so strong and stoic throughout the entire process, which, you know, the process started well over a year before even the indictment. And of course, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll give you some of the backstory, but thank you to all the organizations that, that organized this. Uh, thank you to the MIT community who stood really strong behind Professor Chen and gave great support to me and my team. Um, and thank you to uh, Congressman Liu for being here today and hearing uh, you know, the details of our story. Uh, and of course, you know, again, my name's Rob Fisher. I was the lead attorney for Professor Chen, but. Um, there were other folks from Nixon PB, my partner, Brian Kelly, uh, associate Scott Seitz and associate Brianna Nassif, who uh, did the yeoman's work here, going through gigabytes of material uh, that the feds produced during the, the course of discovery. Uh, but Michael, you summed it up, I think, in the beginning. This was it's a rather straightforward case. Um, it's it's wire fraud, right? Uh, in, in two counts, essentially uh, charging uh, Professor Chen for for misstates, uh, misstatements and omissions on federal grant forms in 2017, and then the renewal of the proposal, the progress report in 2019. Uh, the federal government believed that there were uh, some ties to China and Chinese organizations that should have been reported on those forms and were not. And they claimed that if they, they knew of those ties and associations, they may have been material in the determination to award that grant money to Professor Chen's group. Um, of course, we all know that the indictment and, and frankly, the complaint were not that simple, right? They threw in some tax charges, which, you know, when we first saw those, we, we figured those would be most likely the easiest to defeat. Professor Chen didn't even do his own taxes. Um, you know, they, they threw those charges in, particularly the FBAR charge to make it look like he had some secret undisclosed Chinese bank account when in effect that account had been disclosed to the federal government uh, in multiple years prior. Um, but the trigger is $10,000. And it was simply a Scrivener's error that a, a, a separate box got checked on the taxes. So there was no um, intent to deceive the IRS. In fact, the IRS had been aware of that account in previous years. And all the taxes on any money in any account had been, had been paid to the, uh, the US um, Treasury. So 
Um, we, we were at least worried about those charges. So we focused our energy on the wire fraud charges, which alleged that he didn't alert uh, DOE, the Department of Energy, to various ties to either Chinese universities or Chinese organizations. Um, but, you know, I, I want to let everybody know my background in this case. Um, for I, I, I met Professor Chen, I think, about one year prior to the indictment uh, in, in 2020. Uh, as some of you, I'm sure, have read, when he was traveling back to the United States and landed at Logan Airport, um, he had an issue with customs. Uh, he was brought to secondary, him and his family, um, and he was asked questions about his collaboration with China. And the border agents seized all of his electronics, his MIT laptop, uh, his MIT phone, his personal phone, um, and they asked him why he was in China. So that was really, the, I think, the, the, the first indication of Professor Chen that there was a problem with the federal government and that he may be a target of investigation. And I give him credit. He did the right thing. He did something that not a lot of people uh, know to do is don't talk to agents, federal agents in particular, without a lawyer. Uh, I'm not saying never cooperate with the federal government. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you are going to cooperate with them, you need to have a lawyer with you. Uh, and ideally a lawyer um, who used to work for the feds, you know, somebody who has a white collar uh, background to understand where the FBI may be trying to go, what your status in the investigation is, are you a target, a subject, a witness? These are all very important things before you make any statement um, to a law enforcement or a regulator. And I tell clients that all the time. Um, so Professor Chen went back to MIT and told them of this interaction he had with customs and the fact that they took his electronics and asked for his passwords. Uh, and I think it's important to note Professor Chen had the wherewithal to tell them he was not going to give them the passwords to the electronics. He wanted to speak to MIT and speak to the lawyers there. Uh, and, and that was uh, that was a very good move on his part uh, because it then delayed things once I got involved to, to work with the federal government. But uh, Professor Chen uh, spoke to lawyers at MIT. Um, they reached out to me. I was retained to represent him. And over the course of the next year, along with uh, counsel from MIT, uh, I spoke to uh, many times with prosecutors at the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, and at the FBI trying to figure out what Gong's status was in this investigation. Uh, and that was clear to them that, you know, I, I had spent many months with him uh, and that I wasn't seeing an issue with any of his grant applications and any of his ties to any country, uh, you know, China or, or France or Israel or Egypt or you name it, that we weren't seeing an issue. Uh, and I know my colleagues at, uh, who were representing MIT were also in uh, communication uh, with the federal government. And then you fast forward to the end of 2021, December, uh, you know, I was checking in regularly with the prosecutors and I said, you know, we're, we're, where do things stand? You know, just so you know, I'm more than happy to come in, give a presentation, let you know what, what we found and, and we can have a dialogue about, you know, what the issues may be. Uh, and, and I was told, as was counsel, outside counsel for MIT told, that nothing would be happening probably for at least six months. And that's standard, right? You know, when you have a, a defense attorney reach out to the government, oftentimes they'll be uh, communicative and we'll let you know where things stand, particularly when your client is not a flight risk. And, and Gang was obviously not a flight risk. We knew of the investigation and we were cooperative. And then a, a few weeks later, Jan January 14th of, of 2021, Gang was arrested. My phone went off at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, it was the prosecutors and they told me he was in custody and they were executing a search warrant at his home. I then shortly thereafter heard from outside counsel for MIT that the feds were uh, executing search warrants at MIT. Um, so you can imagine MIT surprised that they had just heard that nothing was happening for months. And of course, Gong surprised that I had told him, you know, we still have time. We'll have time to get in there and speak with them and try to figure out what's happening. And yet now he was under arrest. Uh, of course, I note for everybody that was the last you know, full week of the Trump administration. The U.S. attorney uh, who had been there for years, uh, Andy Lelling, he had you know, only weeks left in that position. Uh, and of course, as I'm sure most people know, uh, uh, U.S. attorney Lelling was on the China Initiative Task Force uh, that Attorney General Sessions had established a couple of years previous. So um, there was, of course, as we expected at the time, a, a large press conference where the special agent charged the FBI spoke, uh, U.S. Attorney Lelling spoke, and you know they said a lot of things at that press conference that we felt were not accurate, right? That this case was not only about greed, which we didn't even think it was about greed because he shouldn't have been charged, but it also was not about ties to China. Um, so we shortly thereafter went on the offensive, you know, right out of the gate. We brought a sanctions motion against the U.S. Attorney. 
um, and had that hearing. And then we started being very aggressive and asking for discovery um, so that we could help defend uh, Professor Chen. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, now that I'm, I've been a, a white collar defense attorney for almost five years, um, you know, you have clients oftentimes who, as you get the discovery, you say, OK, well, this isn't a great fact. And well, this isn't a great email. Um, and we'll try to you know, structure our defense around that. For Professor Chen, that that evidence never came in. You know, they were providing evidence. Obviously, I had uh, access to uh, his emails and whatnot even before the indictment. And we just weren't seeing what the federal government thought they were seeing. Um, and that, to be frank, made our job pretty easy, more frustrating than usual, but, but I think easy in terms of chipping away at the government's case. And then over the course of the year, it became our goal to try to convince the uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI that they were misinterpreting evidence, um, and and so we we still cooperated, frankly, in the investigation. But telling them, hey, this is what we're seeing. We think you're misinterpreting X, Y, and Z. Um, and of course, we brought uh, some motions for Brady material. Um, we litigated pretty fiercely the the SEPA motions. And towards the end of uh, last year, we were getting close to filing some public Brady motions, which were going to reveal some exculpatory evidence that were, was turned over to us that we think really helped Don's case um, and were completely exculpatory. Um, and of course, then I, I know as has been reported, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office interviewed an official at DOE who told them what we had been saying from the beginning and even before the indictment, that if there were items that were not disclosed to DOE, number one, they weren't required to be disclosed under the 2017, 2019 disclosure language. Um, and frankly, factually never even happened. But even if they did happen and were disclosed, they wouldn't have been material anyway. So it was really a three prong approach. Um, and it, as we were, we were told um, that DOE official essentially said the same thing that yes, even if though, even if Professor Chen did have those uh, collaborative uh, interactions with uh, either universities or agencies in China, we they weren't required to be reported under the prior forms. And even if they had been reported, they wouldn't have been material in our decision-making process for the grant. Um, and that led to the ultimate dismissal only weeks later uh, with the new U.S. attorney, uh, Rachel Rollins, appointed by President Biden. So uh, overall, it was a great result. Um, however, it was you know two years of you know Gong's life uh, and his, it, you know, anxiety hanging over him and his family, and particularly the last year, being under federal indictment is a very serious matter. Uh, you know, you have a significant bond. Your 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 house is basically subject to seizure if you violate pretrial conditions. Uh, he wasn't able to go to MIT and teach, um, but I give him all the credit in the world. And like I said in the beginning, he was a great client because he he took my advice in terms. Of, I said, Don, the way we're going to get through this is you're going to let me handle the legal strategy and you're going to you're going to go back to your research and do what you love to do and you're going to help us build out the factual structure of the case but i want to give you as much of your time back to to work in your research and do what you love best if that's going to help get you through this and he listened uh and i think he, even though it was a lot of stress on him and his family uh, i'm just so happy that that he he took that advice uh, and he was strong and we made it out the other end well i i know that's to a large degree, uh, your, your great work on the case. So we really appreciate it. And Professor Chen, uh, can, can you explain the, the the personal and professional effect being under investigation and, and ultimately under charges had and, and how you felt? Um, Michael, thank you. And it's a very emotional day for me. And uh, let me thank uh, all the organizations um, for my host, uh, for organizing this event uh, on my behalf. I would also like to particularly thank uh, Congressman Taylor uh, for your keynote speech and for your fighting for the justice for all of us. I also want to say that uh, I'm the luckiest among unlucky people because I'm painfully aware there are still so many people on, uh, under investigation and unfairly prosecuted. And my hearts go to them and go to their family. I want to thank MIT leadership under President Raphael Reif and 
MIT faculty led by Professor Yor Fink for their brave and steady fast support. Of course, uh, my legal team, uh, Ralph Fisher, Brian Kelly, Super was supported by uh, Scott Sides and uh, Brianna Nassif, and uh, my wife's legal team, led by George Wen. They deserve full credit for not only they bravely and strategically defended us, but also really were the people we could talk to and saw solace from during this difficult time. There are so many people who supported us in different ways, friends, individuals and communities, many of them we actually do not know. From the brief voice of over 200 MIT faculty, which is over 20% MIT faculty, and 1,381 13, individuals signing on the petition that we are all Gang Chen, launched by Professor Jeff Schreider from Northwestern University to over 200, uh, 2,100 people generally support us through GoFundMe. And regular assemblage of gifts and the greetings from my former group members, organized by Professor Chris Dames from UC Berkeley and Tim Fing Law from Notre Dame University. And many uh, flowers, gifts, and cards dropped in front of a door. Really people's kindness warmed our hearts during time of darkness and give us the strength to fight through this injustice. There are many other organizations um, from the American Physical Society president's leadership team to faculty at Stanford University. And in fact, uh, I learned uh, a faculty from 218 universities signing on open letter calling to DOJ calling for staff of the um, China Initiative and many other organizations, and many of you are here, and uh, also Committee 100, uh, say you know, by uh, President Zi Huang and uh, Mr. Brian. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I will spend time later on to reach out to thank you all. I, I'm really very, very grateful. And also do want to say thank you to my family because my wife endured the pain and uh, patient and listened to my scientific discoveries when I had nobody else to talk to. And my daughter's fundraising and the interfacing with people I, without my knowledge. And my son gave me a call every day. And my aging parents in China uh, encouraged me to stay strong. I'm very, very grateful. But let me get into some facts uh, as Rob already explained. And I want to add my personal angle. As you all know, um, the, now the, on January 14, uh, when uh, around 6.30 a.m., I was making coffee, and I saw about 10 to 20 federal agents came in rushing to my home. You know, my immediate reaction, because I knew I was there under investigation, my immediate reaction was, this is a stupid. Really, I, I, I don't want to say that, but uh, through the whole year, entire year, I was thinking, and my wife and I were thinking, come, trying to come up with a different word than stupidity, right? Because I knew, uh, as Rob already explained, uh, when I went through the custom uh, in a year ago, and they took me aside, hold my family there for a few hours, couldn't even go to the restroom. They couldn't even go to the restroom. Interrogated me and asked my password. I do want to say at the time, because the MIT legal counsel had advice that uh, I had the right not to give the passwords. I had nothing to hide, but I know I was a department head. I had my department's say, uh, uh, information there, and I just did not want to release any MIT information to them. So I came back, I wrote to MIT leadership, and they stepped in and uh, uh, found me the legal support as Rob. So I, I was very fortunate to have Rob and his team. And the MIT also had the external legal counsel as Rob explained. So they really looked into everything I did. They know better of me than I know myself now. And they didn't find I, do, I did anything wrong. So I want to say through this experience, really what, uh, what, I, what I see from my angle, 
all the misconducts by FBI and by the prosecutors. And they are patterns. I want to summarize these patterns into seven areas, seven patterns. And I want to give a few examples of each of these. I, and there are few, I, every of this I can list more than this because from their complaint, from their indictment, from their search affidavits, right? I will summarize this in seven area. One, they distort and alter facts. Two, they interpret normal professional activity as crime. Three, they use email I did not reply as criminal evidence. Four, even I did the right thing, follow the rule, they will interpret as I was hiding something. Five, they rushed the case, they did not do their job. Six, they hide the truth. Seven, they never admit mistakes. So let me give you at least one example in each of these to substantiate what I say here. One, they distort and alter facts. This was clear in our sanction uh, of Andrew Lennon because in their com criminal complaint, right, while this was an email I sent to myself. And this was an email when MIT hosted an officer from China's Minister of Science and Technology. I was present in the meeting. I took notes. I had my cell phones. I used my cell phone to take notes. I sent to myself as an email. And in their criminal complaint, they copied every words in their email except the last sentence. And they say, this were the words showing, in fact, they say this is my to-do list. And uh, my loyalty to China. And uh, the last sentence of that email was, Mr. X, let's work together. Had they put this sentence, this X, Mr. X is an officer from MIT. And had they put this sentence there, everybody would understand. It was the notes, right? Yet they cut it off. And what's even more outrageous was in the court hearing, Stephanie Sigmund, the chief prosecutor, said, I, I'm not saying exactly that's the word by word. And she, she said, this could be his notes but it could also be his state of mind. That was a legal terminology I learned. That was basically saying that was my motivation. Okay. And let me give another example because all this news, right? They said I took $19 million and sound like I took it to my own pocket, right? And the day they were here, after they took me away, my wife asked him, what's the charge? And this, one of the agents said, he took $19 million. My wife was angry. And she said, where is that $19 million in my house? And the agent said, at MIT. So they knew MIT it was a contract with MIT. And MIT president clarified it was on MIT news. And yet, they painted me as I took $19 million. $19 million is a big number. It's easy to use in the news conference. So number two, they interpret the normal professional activity as a crime. And that same day, I think, or the next day, Rob told me that the chief prosecutor, Ms. Stephanie Sigma, was most angry with among all those complaints they had there, right? She was most angry that I was a re I serve as reviewer expert for China's National Science Foundation. I think among the audience, many of us know 
this is a part of a regular professional activity. As a professor, we are evaluating three aspects, research, teaching, and service. We do reviews across, say, for many organizations, including foreign organizations. In, in fact, US Department of Energy use foreign reviewers because I attended the meeting with them. I was in the same panel with them, right? This is an all regular professional activity. And yet they interpret this as my service for the PRC. And let me give you, say the number three, they use emails. I did not reply as evidence of my crime. And in fact, exactly on this point, although I did the reviews for many countries, I was too busy. So up to my knowledge, and Rob could confirm from all the emails, right? I never did a review for China's National Science Foundation. And so there are many, several examples of this. I did not reply the email and that they took it as a, a evidence of crime. Number four, even I try, I did the right thing. They said I was hiding something. Let me just give you one example. I'm an academician of Academia Sinica in Taiwan. It's a very prestigious honor. And Taiwan has an office in Boston. And one day I received an email from an officer and want to pay me a visit. At the time, I vaguely remember that uh, the foreign agencies, when they visit campus, they should not, or they have to have permission. So I explained to him, I couldn't do it. And he, he wrote back and say, oh, Taiwan is not on the list. But to be cautious, right? And uh, because I'm a academician there, I, to be polite, out of courtesy, we met off campus. We had lunch there. And that was cited as evidence of me trying to hide something. And again, area of this, I say it's more than just one. I can give some other example. Five, they rushed the case. They did not do their job. Rob already explained, right? And uh, uh, I don't need to say more on that. Number six, they hide the truth, as Rob said. On the day of the, uh, say on January 14, when they arrest me, they went to several, uh, say, witness. And uh, to one witness, they asked specifically whether, say, uh, about uh, my, uh, say, uh, say, Thai, uh, say, Wuhan talent program. And the witness told them clearly that I was not in that talent program. So Rob would say, this is a Brady material, exculpatory material. Any law student knows this are the ones that they have to turn to my defense team. And same, similarly, in March, they interviewed MIT grants officer who specialized in DOE contract. And the officer explained at the time it was not required. And in fact, the DOE as a uh, as requirement that you have to fit everything into two pages, right? And so those are clearly discovered material. And in fact, I say they cited later on, uh, they interviewed DOE. Uh, DOE. Also, there was an article in Science recently by the uh, Office of Science Director, uh, Dr. Chris Fall, clarifying himself that I did not need to disclose this information. And so they had this information in January, in March. They didn't turn to our defense team until say Rob went to them, asked them, 
And they turned more than this two pieces of information. We only knew these two, and they turned a lot. And none of them include the exculpatory information. They hide the truth. Number seven, they never admit mistakes. Nobody had the courage to officially apologize to me, right? They want to hide, they want to get away. In fact, around October, they are telling Rob, my defense team say they want a deferred prosecution agreement. That was a, a difficult decision, right? Because as Rob, Rob would say, he uh, over his many years in prosecution as a lawyer, he didn't say this, this kind of thing. And even they, they, uh, they mentioned, you, you don't need to admit that anything wrong. But I just could not live to, to look at the, in the future and say, I can live with this because they're always misinterpretation and they want to save face. So after I turned that down and they say, Rob, they, we started to prepare the motion. The motion really exposed them. And they start to get worried and uh, start floating, completely drop the case. And that was from November to December. And finally, if you look at the DOJ statement, right? They say they, knew, they have new evidence. That new evidence, of course, they did make the call to DOE under secretary in January, 2021. They could have called before the arrest of 2022, this year, right? They could have called before they arrest me. They could have called when they interviewed the MIT grants officer. They had many opportunities to do so. And yet, in their final statement, they say, in light of new evidence, we decide to drop the case. They say, this is in the name of justice. And I, Congressman, Hello, is here. I respect, fully request the Congress to look into this, DOJ to look into this. I, I, I hope to share these thoughts. Really, that's how I view the whole thing there. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And and Congressman Liu had a uh, a very important clarification question that. Uh, I think Rob touched on when he said this was not a national security case, as, as was somewhat implied by the public statements of the U.S. attorney. Uh, Congressman, do you want to go ahead and ask the question? Sure. And um, I think maybe um, Robert Fisher might be able to also uh, emphasize this as well or explain it. Uh, nothing Dr. Chen did was classified. Uh, this wasn't a classified grant. Uh, and so let's say Dr. Chen never applied for this grant. He could legally still be working on the exact same research, collaborating with the exact same people all around the world. Uh, so there is like zero connection uh, between spying or espionage uh, with relation to applying for a non-classified grant from a federal agency. And what you don't see, right, is the Department of Justice going after professors who don't disclose affiliations with universities and Russia or, or even in our allied countries. I mean, what does not disclosing a university affiliation have anything to do with anything uh, when it comes to getting uh, some sort of spying or espionage charge? I mean, they're just completely unrelated. And so uh, I don't know if Mr. Fisher would like to add anything to that. No, Congressman, you're exactly right. There was there was no classified information here. In fact, all the research that Professor Chen has ever done in the U.S. has been non-classified. It's it's publicly available. All the research, part of the research, it all it has to be published um, so that it's open to everybody. It's all open source. So you're you're exactly right. This and, and I could go on forever. And I want to want to give Professor Lewis a chance to. I, I would love to hear from her too. But I, I would. We can speak for an hour about this. I, I think what happened here is that the China initiative really, um, it, it became a drift from its original purpose, right? 
And what stuck out to me when Attorney General Sessions first gave his press conference about the China Initiative in 2018, he said there were no espionage or spying cases against Chinese individuals uh, for spying for China between 2013 and 2016. So zero, right? Zero. And now all of a sudden in 18, 19 and 20, they're opening up a new case, you know, what, every 10 hours? Well, there aren't, we all know there's not a spy for every country in every district. So they're going to start doing cases that are not connected to the original China initiative. And what I liken it to is how federal prosecutors, um, you know, one tool they use is go after people's tax returns or scrivener's errors they make on federal documents. I think that's what they did here. And unfortunately, what they did is they went, they targeted people with Chinese sounding or Asian sounding names who may have contacts with China that didn't report something. And what I think the agents didn't understand in the prosecutors is just how international uh, these professors are, how their collaboration takes them around the world. They collaborate with somebody in China, somebody in, um, in France, somebody in Poland, somebody in Canada. And what they were scanning these uh, applications for was, did you not tell us about some connection you had to somebody in China? And that had nothing to do with classified research, that had nothing to do with trade secrets, it had nothing to do with espionage, but it was a way to drum up statistics and cases um, that they were then you know, shoehorning into the China initiative. And clearly, because these cases are now falling apart, we can see that was an error. So yes, there, were, there was no classified information. Professor Chen has never had access to classified information. And I would, you know, I, I'm sure if you asked him, you'd say he has no interest in the rest of his career having access to classified information after this. Right. Can, I, can I also add? Can I also sure. add? Go ahead. I think the MIT has a clear rule. There's no classified research on campus, pure. So if there are expert control and classified research, it's not done on campus. So that's a, I think this is a true for pretty much every university. We all publish, mm -hmm. right? Even if we, we have a contract with the industry, they must agree that we publish the result. So it's all open research, basic research. Great, thank you. And, and now uh, I'd like to bring in Professor Maggie Lewis, uh, particularly because your research uh, it, it was fundamental to my understanding and, and confirmed some of my concerns about the China Initiative from the very beginning. Uh, you wrote a very seminal piece, Criminalizing China, that discussed this. Uh, but can you tell us how Professor Chen's case fits in to the overall China Initiative and, and our concerns with it? Well, thanks, Mike, and, and thanks to all the organizers, not just for this webinar, but for now years of collective action. Um, really, it's just been a tremendous group to work with. And thank you to Professor Chen and, and to his family for um, your strength and for not accepting a deferred prosecution agreement, which was gutsy um, and, and really, you know, something that I, I think people who aren't working in criminal justice, you know, don't realize just how, how much you really believed um, in your, your case and, and your lawyers to do that. Um, and I'd also like to say happy Lunar New Year to everyone who's celebrating. Uh, so Hunian Daji, and let's hope for an auspicious year of the tiger, uh, including the end of the China initiative. But I think one of my main points is that even if um, Department of Justice, you know, tomorrow says, okay, you know, we're ending the China initiative. Uh, that's not the end of this effort. You know, that is a necessary, but an insufficient step to deal with these bigger issues. And here, you know, this is not just something too that of course started in 2018, which feels so long ago, even now when Jeff Sessions stood up at the microphone. A lot of the cases that have already been discussed tonight were or my tonight, I'm in Taiwan. There's my connectivity to this part of the world, but were already happening well before for that. And this goes back decades where you have the perpetual outsider, the questioning of people based on their ethnic heritage, their national origin. So I just want to say a few words about that bias concern. And I really so appreciate uh, Representative Liu bringing up this pushing of the government to do not just training, but because we know that just getting people together for a few hours and giving them implicit bias training will not solve this, but really pushing to do the hard work because 
Uh, we're humans and prosecutors are humans and investigators are humans, which means they're fallible. Uh, and we really need the humility to recognize that fallibility and then the determination to do something about it. And, and under the Trump administration, I think we saw much more that uh, overt, the explicit bias, the questioning of you know, Dr. Chen and others based on where they were born or, or their, you know, their ethnicity and uh, race. And, you know, but now under Biden, I, I understand and I appreciate that they've dialed back the rhetoric. You know, also we hear a lot less about the communist and uh, the Chinese Communist Party, but that again, the changing of the rhetoric does not solve these underlying concerns about how our brains work. And if you slap the name China Initiative onto a major you know, push of the Department of Justice, and even today, and I checked today, um, the website that has the representative cases and introduces the China Initiative, still Still speaks in terms of the strategic priority of countering Chinese national security threats. And no matter how many times um, they'll throw in the sentence of, well, we, we mean the government or we mean the, the party state, we don't mean the people. If you keep saying China threat and Chinese threat, it's going to push people's brains a certain direction and linger on and look with more scrutiny on people who have certain characteristics, whether that be their physical characteristics and where they were born, or even just connectivity to China. Um, We've seen cases where the defendant um, was, you know, someone who maybe looked like me, but the press release has mentioned that they spoke fluent Chinese, or it's looked at how they've, you know, studied or worked there or something that makes it so that that is worthy of suspicion. And so just taking away the name China Initiative will help a little bit, but it doesn't deal with the more deep seated issues. And I come to these issues as someone who is a China studies person. I first went to Beijing in 1995. It was a very different time. I'm in Taiwan right now. And you know, when I look at US-China relations today, I recognize that it's, about, it's the worst I've seen it. And it's not going to get better anytime soon. Um, we look in Congress, we have this massive, I think it's 2000 page America Competes Act. It is directly squarely talking about China for a lot of it. It's saying, you know, flat out, we should make it illegal to not have, or you, know, you cannot be in a foreign talents plan and receive certain federal funding. You know, this competition is here to stay which means the domestic reverberations of those tensions are here to stay. So we really need to look not just in terms now of getting rid of the name China initiative, but doing the work on the bias training, but also just thinking about how do we have competition in a way that also is not undermining our values. And here, We've heard from people who've worked in the China Initiative that, of course, one of the big pushes they wanted was with this was to have this uh, deterrent effect or in sort of lame person's terms to scare people to say, if you do work with China, watch out. If you participate in a talent plan that itself is not illegal, but you better make sure that you have checked every box, you know, right. Otherwise, we will come after you. And what we're seeing now is that is having not just a deterrent effect, perhaps on illegal behavior, the behavior we want to stop, but it's having a general chilling effect. We are losing the scientific brains that the United States needs to create the intellectual property to continue to compete in the future. And we are also cutting off the pipeline of new talent that used to come from China and other countries to the United States to be the next Professor Chen. And so what I find you know, so frustrating on top of just you know that this is wrong to treat people differently based on who they are, not what they do, but also that if the fundamental purpose of the China Initiative was to protect intellectual property, was to make it so the US could compete, we need the brains to do that. And the deterrent effect is spilling over into over deterrence. So I think right now, I really hope that, you know, everyone can, you know, keep fighting to get rid of the China initiative. That's the first step, but continue to also have momentum to deal with these bigger issues. And just finally, um, I, you know, I so appreciate that um, Rob Fisher saying, you know, do not talk to the government without a lawyer, which is critical. Uh, but 
lawyers are expensive. And I so appreciate that MIT um, has been there through this whole ordeal for Professor Chen, both um, supporting him with um, moral support, but financial support. But he is highly unusual, if not unique. I don't know if there's another uh, defendant in the, in the China initiative who has had that level of financial support. So a lot of these cases have pled out and they've been resolved through plea bargains. And that's a feature of our criminal justice system. That's not a bug. That's not particular to the China initiative. But you know, we, we don't know because there's such a black box around plea bargains, how much that is partially could be because people just don't have the resources to fight these cases for years. And the nature of discovery too, which we're hearing in this case was so critical, is that a lot of the discovery happens late in the game. It happens as you get close to trial. There's not that at the time of the plea bargain that the prosecutors need to show their hands. We only really do that in the courtroom. So that means when you see a plea bargain, the person has done this with probably you know, insufficient information to know all that's going on on the government side. And I really think too that this shows some of the deeper flaws with our criminal justice system that are much bigger than just the China initiative cases themselves. So I'll stop there, but I, you know, I look forward to more discussion and taking some of the questions. Great. Thank you very much, Maggie. And, and I think that's key. And, and, you know, one of the things that I want to get to is, is how we hold the Justice Department and the FBI accountable for their errors and, and uh, overreach here. And uh, Rob, you talked about a, a sanctions memo. So, trying to employ the courts to hold the Justice Department responsible. Obviously, Maggie, you and I from our, our, our public platforms try to hold the government responsible when we see errors in the public. And Congressman Liu, what tools are available for Congress to use and how do we as citizens empower you to do that kind of work? How best can we do that? Uh, thank you, Michael, for your question. Uh, I think Abraham Lincoln had it right when he said public sentiment is everything. Uh, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So I think trying to shift public sentiment uh, would be helpful so that people understand that innocent folks uh, are getting railroaded in the United States. Uh, and that shouldn't be happening. Uh, this is a, not a partisan issue. This is to do with racial profiling uh, of innocent people. And again, when you look at uh, the last string of cases brought by Department of Justice, none of it has anything to do with spying or espionage because this is not classified work. This is open source work. And it makes you wonder, well, why are they going after professors who happen uh, to be Asian? I mean, how many uh, press releases do you see they generate about professors that don't disclose uh, or do paperwork errors of affiliations with universities and other parts of the world. And, and it really makes you wonder why are they even spending their precious resources focus on this when it clearly has nothing to do with spying or espionage. So what folks do is raise public awareness uh, through events like this. They can contact the senators and members of Congress. And then within Congress, we've held hearings on this issue. We've done press conferences. Uh, we've done op-eds. We've worked with the various civil rights organizations. Uh, so it really requires everyone being engaged and continuing to raise this issue and um, really hammer in the point that you don't racially profile uh, anyone in the United States. That is illegal and is wrong. Thank you. And, and Rob, can you tell us about how trying to use the courts to, to hold uh, the Justice Department accountable for their public statements? Yeah, like I, like I said um, earlier, Michael, we filed a sanctions motion um, to, to try to get the federal judge um, to issue a reprimand, or at least tell them to, to tone down the rhetoric. We have a local rule here in Massachusetts, as many other districts do, that don't allow um, lawyers who are involved in the case to make public statements about the underlying facts of the case. Now, that still allows for the U.S. attorney and others to have a press conference and you know repeat what they've already alleged. And I would note, that this case was not a just, just an indictment in the beginning. This was originally brought by a criminal complaint, which there's a difference there. In, in, in federal practice, typically people are arrested once they've been indicted by a grand jury. And I would have expected that in Professor Chen's case. He was under investigation for at least a year. That's plenty of time to 
have agents and witnesses testify before a federal grand jury. You get a sealed indictment. You get your arrest warrant. You arrest him. He's arraigned on the indictment. What they did here is they 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 filed a criminal complaint. So you had an agent draft an affidavit, bring it to a magistrate judge and get an arrest warrant based upon a complaint, not a grand jury decision. Uh, and then you have 30 days to bring an indictment to take uh, the place of that complaint. Now, in a complaint that's usually more verbose, there's more language in it, uh, it it's a, can be a lengthy affidavit. And that will allow a prosecutor, a U.S. attorney or the FBI to give a press conference where they can then repeat everything in that complaint. So they have a lot more to say about the underlying case. Um, so I think that was part of the strategy here. You want more bang for your buck. You want to have a press conference. You want to be able to say a lot without violating the local rule. And then you follow that up only within days with an indictment, which is much more bare bones than the complaint, because you don't want the full complaint going to the jury necessarily, because you would have had to prove all, the, all that information in the complaint. And that may have been difficult to do during a trial, right? So that I think was part of the strategy here. Now we use the sanctions process to try to push back um, on the misstatements. But now the case is dismissed, so I can't use the courts. I can't file a motion before federal judge Saris and ask for relief because the case is over. We don't have that platform anymore. So I think the platform now would be for the Department of Justice, either through the Office of Inspector General um, or an internal office at DOJ to review what happened here. Right? If, if mistakes were made, who made them? How did they not repeat those again? Uh, and of course, there's, as Congressman Lou said, there's always Congress, right? They could always, you know, take up this issue. But I think in the first instance, um, the, the fastest uh, recourse would be uh, the OIG to look into it or some internal, maybe the Office of Professional Responsibility at DOJ to review what happened here. Thank you. Michael. Go ahead, Jan. Gun. Rob, as I mentioned and, uh, in my previous uh, statement, uh, I did not emphasize the misconduct FBI really. Um, uh, the FBI uh, chief here, uh, Mr. Joseph Bonomolanto, uh, had a, a press conference. I watched it just a few weeks ago, and uh, almost everything they said was false. I tried to record it, but at the time I was so disgusted I didn't record. And they lied before my case was dropped. I said I must record it. I went there, it's gone. So if any of the people in the audience happen to record it, please let me know. Thank you. Um, and and it, it, fortunately, the MIT administration stood behind you and the faculty as well, including faculty from other universities. But what advice would you give to university administrators about how to prepare before somebody is, is targeted? In, in other words, we, we often see uh, the FBI making liaison relationships with the heads of universities, trying to explain to them the very real problem of, of Chinese espionage. But that is, kind of puts the FBI and, and leadership in, in, in a room where faculty and, and students and staff don't have the opportunity to express their concerns about this kind of approach. And it's, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that it's not just the Justice Department and the FBI, but other government elements, <clears throat> National Institutes of Health and some of the <clears throat> departments that, that are providing these scientific grants. H how should the university administration look at this effort and how can they better protect their, their students, faculty, and staff. Do you have any advice for them? Yes, uh, uh, well, just uh, some thoughts. First, uh, I really see, uh, see the fact that, that the MIT leadership stood up and uh, defended, say, uh, provided financial support and uh, support me and as uh, every way set a great example for the other university to follow. And also I would say the MIT faculty led by Professor Yo Fink. And really, I just met you the last Friday. We had a professional activity uh, interaction before, but the night I was arrested, he spent the night to prepare slides and get faculty together. And uh, uh, really show the, those are the facts. And there is a threat because everybody 
could be see, uh, fit into the into their uh, say not uh, say, uh, say many people could be uh, uh, wrongly accused because of what they accused me could fit into many people. So uh, I remember when I talked to you and he cited uh, this uh, poem by Martin Neumuller and who was a uh, uh, say in camp, uh, say in the concentration camp during World War II, the last uh, concentration camp. And the poem is, is first they came to a socialist. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one to speak out. So I think it's very important for faculty, for university leaders to stand up and speak out. And uh, it's really the chilling effect to the scientific community. I think the university leadership all understand how damaging this is to not only faculty, right? It's really to US, to the entire international scientific enterprise. And when we face urgent problems like COVID-19 and global warming, well, this chilling effect really will hurt everybody, ourselves, our kids, and prosecutor and the FBI, they're, they're themselves. Okay, so we have to organize and stand up. Let's see, of course, in terms of the detail, how, uh, how to, let's see, uh, we're not uh, naive, like uh, MIT uh, faculty said, we're not naive, right? We know how important also to keep our secret, right? In fact, as a faculty member, when we have our research advances, we are pretty protective amongst ourselves. We, we collaborate, but we also know how to protect uh, our own information. So I think I think I say we need to increase the mutual understanding between the federal government, the agencies, and uh, say the academia. I promise uh, I, Rob, Rob knew that after this, I'll be happy to go to talk to the uh, U.S. Attorney Office to explain to them, to educate them how research is done. Because this, this is a really damaging to US and we all suffer. Thank you. And you, one of the things that, that has become obvious to me is, is there is a, uh, a fundamental uh, difference or confusion in the way the uh, intelligence community views collaboration with foreign entities and the way the scientific and research and academic community views that, uh, 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 whether, whether that's threatening or necessary. And uh, Maggie, I know that even within the government, uh, there, there's a difference of opinion between how the, the intelligence community is looking at foreign collaboration and even the, like the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Uh, can you talk about how that that difference and, and how that is is causing some of this uh, confusion in, in what becomes a national security issue to the government? I think overall we're seeing a greater securitization of the U.S.-China relationship, and and I would say an over securitization of seeing connections um, through a security lens. And that's that's not to say that there aren't real concerns about what's going on in Beijing and what Xi Jinping's plans are. I mean, he's been very clear, and and the rest of the leadership that they want the. China, People's Republic of China, to grow in its technology prowess, to attract the best and brightest minds. 
And, and there are clear cases where illegal means abroad have been used to do that. So there is a there there. There is a reason to be concerned. But we don't want to inflate that threat and we don't want to conflate it with other issues. So research integrity, saying that people need to be honest when they're getting government money, that is a yes, that is a goal that we all stand behind. But the question is, you know, first of all, is it clear what people need to disclose? Um, you know, is this something that they can comply with? Is it feasible? And also is the criminal law and particularly felony charges that can have years behind bars the way to do that? And so I'm glad to see under OSTP, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and Lander that they're talking about how do we streamline across different grant um, granting agencies to make the forms you know easier and clearer. Um, we're seeing in NSPM 33 the National Security Presidential Memorandum, which is about research security, and now we're getting guidance out of that conversations about enhancing research integrity. Um, there's the DARPA threat matrix, but with all of these, you know, we have to be so careful that it's not saying because because of your connectivity to a place, you are deserving of enhanced scrutiny. And so here's a time that we need to have be very vigilant about what are considered threats and what are considered reasons to think that someone is suspicious. Because again, these are so much bigger than just the China initiative. Talk to people who are Asian American about what it's like to work at DOD, at the Department of Defense or the State Department. You will get story after story about how they are questioned because they have relatives in China. So these are big systemic issues. So yes, research integrity, research security, we should take that seriously. And there's a lot of work to be done in collaboration between the government and the scientific community. But there's also a lot of collaboration needed with the communities that do work with criminal justice, um, with communities that look at bias and how that pervades the system. And I would say also with the China studies community, because not every connection with the People's Republic of China raises national security concerns. I am gutted that we don't have the Fulbright program anymore. Because again, if we want to have the United States be in a strong competitive position, then we need information and we need to understand China. And the way we do that is by studying it, by having people who speak the language, by having people who have in-country experience, and we are losing that. And that is to the detriment of all Americans. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Michael, uh, Michael, yes. can I read an email? I received an email this morning. I'm not going to say whom, but it's a colleague of mine. Okay. And he wrote that this is a, a few of us. He said, when writing a quarterly DOE report this morning, I was saddened by the fact that, that I had to add this section. I realized that China initially had discouraged, discouraged researchers in my team from asking question to, questions directly to our Chinese counterparts, impeding technology transfer from China to, you, to, to the US. The lack of open scientific dialogue put us at a unique disadvantage relative to other countries and reduces the positive impact of our work, industry, and academia. This is just an email I just received this morning, not related to this. You say the, the damage is causing to us, to US. Exactly, and I've been receiving questions from some of our special guests and and shout out Yang John has asked about how the, the, the disclosure process for these grants has changed. And in your case, as, as Rob suggested, you know, looking at, at, at those applications after the process has changed puts the researchers in a fundamentally uh, unsafe position where, where a different standard is being applied now because of the way the, the relationship has changed. And how, how do, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the, the grants themselves are, are, are asking for the appropriate information so that this type of, of judgment can be made more clearly? Michael, Michael if, I, if I may, I, I pulled up the language because I think it's important. So DOE, they changed their forms in October of 2020. Um, so after um, the, the forms that were charged in Gong's case, okay? So, so Gong's forms were 2017, 2019. But it, it, it's very important the way they changed them. They put a warning, it actually says warning in bold. 
right? The form now says, warning, these instructions have been significantly revised to require a disclosure of a variety of potential conflicts of interest. Um, and down the end, it says, all foreign government-sponsored talent recruitment programs must be identified in current and pending support. So they clearly changed it. And we were going to use that uh, to our benefit at trial. Um, we wanted to get clear information from the government. Why did that change? And what thought process was behind that? That was clearly material to our, our defense. If that indicates to me that the government didn't think their form was clear enough when Gong and MIT filled it out. Uh, of course, little, you know, little do we know that the DOE uh, grant uh, administrator at MIT had already told the government that, that, well, yeah, under the prior language, nothing you're accusing Gang of would have been disclosable and therefore it wasn't material. So people need to be very cognizant of the changes that we're starting to see from these government agencies. Yes. And, and uh, you, you, we, we have a government here that, that is both responsible for protecting our security and our civil rights. And that's always uh, a very difficult thing. And, and one of the things we need to make sure our civil rights are protected is transparency. And Congress took one step towards that transparency with the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020, which demanded that the Office of Director of National Intelligence produce a report about how it's protecting Chinese American civil rights while conducting its important work on, on security. Uh, but that report hasn't been produced. Uh, Representative Liu, do we know how, how, how we can put pressure on, on the Director of National Intelligence to get this report produced to make sure that they are putting enough emphasis not only on protecting uh, scientific collaboration uh, that's necessary to US science and development, but also civil rights that are important to the, every community in the United States. Uh, thank you, Michael, for raising that issue. Uh, we will follow up uh, with the agency to see if they can expedite that report. Expedite that report, and I think this sort of goes back to your earlier question of, of what people can do. Uh, so you've seen a number of universities, um, well, I should say, professors at a number of universities issue letters, essentially saying uh, and noting all the problems with the China Initiative. So if you're a professor, faculty member at a university that has not done that, think about trying to. Uh, do that and get a, a letter signed by various faculty. I think that would be helpful. We've seen different organizations also uh, come out. For example, there was a, I'm gonna get the name wrong, but it was basically, I think the molecular biologist uh, or something along those effects. Uh, that organization sent out a letter noting the problems of what the China Initiative was doing in terms of research and so on. And I think if more people got these letters uh, sent in to not only policymakers, but also Department of Justice, I think it'll make them much more aware of the harms of pursuing sort of the stupid administrative paperwork cases uh, against professors. Thank Michael, you very much. I, Go ahead. Can I also add, uh, this also come back to your previous uh, question. And uh, uh, I think it's very important that the government do not create a terror on university campus. The, the our ability to attract talent is is really the strength of the country, and uh, what we're doing is destroying that strength. And the um, uh, so there is a question about who is going to be responsible, right? Who is the first responder for violation? And then if every time you send the FBI agent, right, the clerk clerical error, you send the F FBI agent, you're going to terrorize the entire scientific community in US. It's to our disadvantage. The second point I want to make uh, through this own, my own example, is the federal agency needs to educate the program managers and need to stand up to protect their own researchers, not through them under the bus. And they, uh, this is a clear, right? Uh, uh, the few weeks ago, um, I think last week, uh, the science reported why uh, the, the case fell apart and uh, interviewed uh, the Office of Science Director of DOE, uh, Dr. Chris Fall. So DOE knew very well, I did not violate any rule. And they could have stood up as MIT president, say, I did not take 19 million, it was the MIT contract. So those are the really, we want a strong science program. 
we need to protect the researchers when they knew the researcher didn't do anything wrong, didn't violate any rule. Those are the two points I want to make. Great, thank you. And, and I think that that's a very important point that you know, e even as we're, we're correctly criticizing government officials who engage in, in inappropriate conduct, we need to celebrate the people who are doing the right thing. And that's often very difficult. So you know, one of the things that I think we have to keep in this conversation as well is to protect whistleblowers. Uh, in, in one China initiative set of cases, uh, it was an FBI analyst who had written in dissent in a memo uh, about how the case was proceeding that when that became discovered through the, the preparations for the trial resulted in, in, in a dismissal of the case. So, you know, it, unless the, the employees who are trying to do the right thing are empowered and protected, uh, we can't expect them to, to do the right thing. So it's, it's essential. And, and um, I, I'm sorry that we've taken uh, so much time. I, I, I wish we had another hour to go over this. There's so many important things to discuss. Uh, and I, I definitely appreciate also the questions that were uh, added to the chat and, and provided by our special guests, particularly Stefan Meyer uh, Peter, and Peter Michelson. Uh, and I tried to get those questions in as we went uh, because there was a lot of overlap. But uh, I really appreciate your, your support to the panelists. Thank you very much for, for uh, your courage and for all the work that you've put into this. And, and Representative Liu, thank you for your continued uh, support and, and ac actions in Congress. Um, it, 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 we have just a few minutes, but if, if any of you have some last comments to make, uh, you can say them now or, or whatever statement you'd like to make, uh, particularly Professor Chen. Um, thank you. And uh, I, I also want to say, uh, I was uh, always thought uh, I'm a scientist, I'm away from politics. I don't care about politics. And that this ordeal taught me dearly that you can't get away from politics. Politics affect, impact every one of us. So we, when we say things, let's say uh, unjust, we need to stand up. So this is a word. I say my colleagues send me the Martin Luther King's quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let's stand up against injustice. Let's speak out. And we save our country by speaking out. We save the world by speaking out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, I'd like to just make one, one comment just, just to make clear for everybody listening is that I know we've, we've, we've talked a lot about DOJ and the FBI, but as it, some of the, the comments I've, I've seen posted, it's not just those agencies, right? You have the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, at many agencies investigating these cases, whether it's DOE, NASA, NIH. You know, we all know the alphabet soup of government agencies. They all have an OIG, right? And they're looking to make cases like FBI agents are looking to make cases and federal prosecutors are. So it's important for people to know that just because the enforcement uh, body coming to speak with you or the regulator speaking to you isn't with the FBI, you still have the right to get a lawyer, right? Whether it's a customs agent at the airport or a NASA OIG officer, um, you should speak to a lawyer before talking to them about anything to do with any of your grants uh, or, or what, what you're doing here in the U.S. That's very important to know. Uh, just on that, uh, Rob, I also want to emphasize when you, we all understand, but speak to your spouse, speak to your family about this. Because I have seen FBI agent come, they know they could not talk to my colleague because they're agreement, they're lawyers, but they can go to talk to spouse. So uh, I just want to make that point and reminder. Uh, I, right. Michael, I do see uh, Professor Xiaoxin, she's had a reason. I don't know whether you had time to ask him to speak. Some Mike, time. I just want to jump in, though, and just I know it's been in the chat, but to emphasize that Asian Americans Advancing Justice on their website has tons of information about Know Your Rights, 
um, about, you know, how you can protect yourself. And I think it's so important that people know those resources are there. It's, it's, it's a start. Again, it's not do that instead of having a lawyer, but it'll help to give people a sense of what their rights are. Um, and I also just more generally too, they have great resources on things like bystander training, because as we all know that this isn't just about, again, the China initiative or what's happening with investigations of scientists, that Asians, um, AP, AAPI communities are facing intense discrimination, hate crimes, um, and that there's just a lot of resources there that you know, we can all help, you know, even people who are not part of the scientific community. I study criminal justice and human rights, right? We can all do something. And I so appreciate that one thing too, that uh, Professor Chen has said in his talks and, and to the media is that we all need to speak out. And I think that is critical, that this is something that everyone can do something positive to make a difference. Let me follow up on what Professor Lewis just said in, in terms of speaking out. I want all of you to understand your power to help shape public sentiment. Social media is free. If you write an interesting post, maybe it'll affect someone in Kentucky or in Tennessee or Florida or California. Think about writing letters to the editor. Uh, it is true that many people write letters to the editor, uh, to newspapers. It's also true many of them come from the same people. So when you start writing again, eventually you're gonna be able to get published and start changing hearts and minds. Think about running for a school board or city council, or getting involved in politics. Uh, all this is very helpful uh, because this discrimination goes far greater than racial profiling at the Department of Justice. Uh, we have hate crimes because of the pandemic. Uh, we've had hate crimes even before the pandemic. And our history in the United States has been littered with lots of discrimination against people of Asian descent. Uh, so speaking out and trying to shape public sentiment is very important. And thank you all for uh, participating. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to all the panelists and thanks to the sponsoring organizations and for uh, anybody who's listening, that Know Your Rights training is very important. I think uh, a, a lot of the reason for the positive result in this case is because Professor Chen understood his rights and, and protected them. Uh, so you can reach out to the sponsoring organizations, APA Justice, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the Brennan Center, uh, to, to make sure that we can connect you to support that you can have in the legal community. Um, but uh, we're almost out of time. So uh, I'll just thank everybody and turn it, turn it back over to Yasheng. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me acknowledge uh, Chris uh, Dames, Chair and Professor of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, UC Berkeley, as a special guest. My apology that I omitted uh, mentioning him at the beginning. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Ted Liu, for your fight for racial justice and also for your broader fight to preserve rule of law in America. Thank you, Rob, for your excellent work for Gang and for all of us. Thank you, Maggie, for your wisdom and for sharing your knowledge of laws with us for all this time. Thank you, Michael, for your expert moderating of today's panel. Thank you, Gang, for your moving account. The injustice you suffered is simply unspeakable. Your suffering is our suffering. Your struggle is our struggle. Your fight is our fight. Let me urge all of us that Gang's case makes it absolutely clear that we cannot and we should not take the words of the DOJ at their face value. They manipulated and altered evidence, and they acted in bad faith. If the cases of Xiao Xing Xi, An Ming Hu, and Gang Chen do not convince you of this point, I do not know what will. Let me end the webinar with a special appeal to university administrators. Please take this point from today's webinar into your heart. Support your faculty next time something like this happens at your campus. Thank you all, the panelists, attendees, co-organizing uh, uh, organizations. See you next time at our future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.